During World War II, American cities blacked out, had blackout drills, even though it wasn't really necessary. Oh, jeez. Fix these mics. During World War II, American cities had blackout drills, fearing that enemy bombers would come over and bomb cities like Omaha and Pittsburgh. Those blackout drills weren't really necessary because that wasn't really a threat because the enemy didn't really have that long range bombing capability. However, along the Atlantic coast, cities and towns really should have blacked out because there was a very real and lethal threat there. U.S. merchant ships were plying the waters up and down the eastern seaboard, uh, not only to go to supply Great Britain and Russia, our allies, but also ferrying supplies, a lot of fuel, a lot of oil from South America and, and, and Mexico and the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, up around Florida, up the Atlantic coast uh, to New Jersey and points north. Lots of U.S. merchant ships. And every night they would sail and after Pearl Harbor, they would sail and be silhouetted against the horizon by the lights of the towns and cities along the Atlantic coast. German U-boats, submarines, would look through their periscopes and see these U large U.S. targets and fire at will. Uh, this was called the happy time. This is what the German Navy called the happy time or the golden time. Uh, one U.S. historian has called this the second Pearl Harbor because it was such a catastrophe. The German Navy inflicted tons of damage on U.S. merchant shipping in the first six months of 1942, and they did it largely with very few U-boats. There were very few submarines, German submarines. Hitler believed that the U.S. would protect their merchant ships better than they did. Uh, so Admiral Donitz, the German commander, was only able to get five submarines at first. The first week of this German operation called Operation Drumbeat, um, those five submarines sank 25 U.S. ships. 25 U.S. ships. They were hanging off just a few miles offshore. Uh, so Donitz kept ordering, you know, radioed Hitler, send me more U-boats, send me more U-boats. I mean, because this is, this is like a shooting gallery. Uh, these ships were operating as if it were peacetime. They were, they were sailing with their lights on at night. They were using open, non-secure channels of uh, radio communication. Uh, they weren't going in convoys. They didn't have escorts, armed escorts. They were just so vulnerable. And night after night, these U.S. ships, and they were largely uh, oil tankers, it's 95% of all oil tankers that sailed up the East Coast in the first six months of 1942 were sunk, 95%. Uh, Donitz was able to get some medium-range submarines there, not even long-range. Uh, and he was able to park or you know anchor um, uh, fueling ships, refueling ships in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean so that these submarines, when they needed to be refueled, wouldn't have go have to go back all the way to France to get refueled. They could stop in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, get refueled, and then go shoot more American ships. Over 600 U.S. ships were sunk in the first six months of 1942. Over 600. This was Operation Drumbeat. Nobody, no Americans knew about this. This was top secret. There was one day where they where the uh, German U-boat sank uh, two freighters, two tankers, broad daylight, right off the coast of Virginia Beach. There were people on the beach kind of having a, you know, having a picnic. And they looked offshore in horror as two tankers just exploded uh, and sank right before their very eyes. And these kind of beachgoers were told not to tell anybody about it. The German U-boat commander that sunk those two uh, freighters said, his name was uh, Reinhard Hardigan. He said, all the vacationers had seen an impressive special performance at Roosevelt's expense. A burning tanker, artillery fire, the silhouette of a U-boat. How often had all of that been seen in America? And that was the thing. The U.S. just was not prepared for that kind of uh, naval warfare so close to our coast. We didn't think that German U-boats would come that close, and we didn't really have much of a defense. Uh, there had not been many pleas at first 
to dim the lights or shut the lights along the Atlantic coast, Britain had known that this was going to happen. Britain had warned the U.S., you better black out your Atlantic coast every night because the Germans will be there waiting to sink your merchant ships. They had warned us and we did not heed the warning. And one of the reasons we didn't heed it is because, you know, the mayors and city councils and businesses in these beach towns along the coast, they depended on the revenue. They depended on the tourist income. And they didn't want to black out their theaters and their, you know, their boardwalks at night. I mean, that's where they, that's, that, that was where they got their income. So uh, there was a real, there was really, really hard politically to get these towns and cities to black out. Uh, finally, it, it got so bad that, uh, that uh, George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, had to contact the fleet commander, Ernest King. And Ernest King is, has gotten a lot of blame for this because King, King was really the one, he could have given the order to these coastal cities to black out, and he just did not give the order. He didn't, he didn't think there was a threat. He, he didn't like the British. He didn't want to take uh, British, British commands or British advice. Uh, but finally, uh, George Marshall wrote a, a, a pretty stern letter to King, and he said, the losses by submarines off our Atlantic seaboard and in the Caribbean now threaten our entire war effort. Dwight Eisenhower put it in his diary a little bit more bluntly. He said, one thing that might help win this war is to get someone to shoot King. I mean, that's how dire it became. So finally, the order was given to dim out or black out the first you know, three to six miles from the shore. Uh, you couldn't have lights shine directly into the Atlantic toward the coast. Um, you, you, and when you got within three miles of shore, you had to kind of dim, have, uh, you know, dim, dimmers on your headlights as you drove. Uh, but that really wasn't enough. To, to really reduce the silhouette to zero, you needed to black out cities every night for 25 miles inland. And that never happened. Uh, by June 1942, however, the U.S. did start a convoy system, did begin to uh, uh, apply escorts, you know, armed escorts to these merchant ships, and also began flying patrols over the coast to protect the ships. Submarines, uh, U-boats, submarines are very vulnerable to being spotted from the air. And so the, the minute they see an airplane overhead, they dive to, to escape it. And so uh, the U.S. had a remarkable had a remarkable program called the Civil Air Patrol. And it, this was really a case of supply and demand. We needed the air patrols over the coast. We didn't have the military aircraft to do it. Uh, but we did have 100,000 private licensed pilots in the country who volunteered at no pay, they would be reimbursed, I think, for their fuel and maybe a little bit of a stipend. They volunteered for these pretty dangerous mission to fly their little Piper Cubs over the coast, you know, several miles, hundreds of miles into, you know, frigid North Atlantic waters, just kind of uh, patrolling areas and looking for German U-boats. I mean, the first day that the Civil Air Patrol was put into action in June 1942, uh, an, an enemy U-boat that was about to fire on a target spotted the plane and broke from the target and 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 sank, um, took a dive so that it wouldn't be spotted. This happened almost every day uh, in the war because of the Civil Air Patrol. These were dangerous missions. At least 60 or 70 of these pilots went on a mission and never came back. Um, they weren't easy and they really made a difference. Civil Air Patrol also, in the early days of the war, they would, uh, they would uh, pass messages, they were used for reconnaissance, they would pull targets for you know, target training. Um, and then finally in 1943, the Air Force absorbed the Civil Air Patrol into an auxiliary of the Air Force. Uh, there was, so there was fear on the East Coast and damage on the East Coast. There was also damage by the Japanese on the West Coast, and I'll talk about that next. Sit here and be a good girl. Sit here and be a good girl. <laughs> All right, well, well, there were blackouts in interior American cities like Omaha and Pittsburgh, and there really didn't have to be because the enemy didn't have long-range bombers. The enemy didn't have long-range bombers that, that could reach those targets in World War II. During World War II, 
During World War II, American cities had blackout drills, uh, fearing that Amer that uh, 